you, Eric. Thanks to Sean for playing tunes for Ethan, leading us in communion. Thanks to Matt and Sean and Sarah for running stuff in the back. Good morning. My name is Mike. I'm one of the leaders here, and uh, this is the Easter gathering for Communitas Church. Thanks for being here. Kids, are you excited about a few things happening today? Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the kids that left and are leaving and for their presence here among us. It is such a delight to be with them. And so uh, I, I've, I've, I've missed most of them. So uh, I won't even try to go through all the names today, but Lord, uh, we thank you for these kids and kids, we thank you for your presence here among us and the honor that it is to, um, to be discipled and, and to disciple you and to learn what it's like to walk uh, in obedience to the faithful Father, that by your Spirit, Lord, that you, you fill us because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that we can follow and obey the Father. Psalm 1 says, blessed is, is the man who follows in, in your way. And so, Lord, we pray that, that we would be those who do follow and help others to do the same, that we would receive this blessing, recognizing that you have given it to us, and that we would give it to others. Amen. Um, okay, so this is a question only for those of you who have been in this building and have walked through that door more than 10 times. If you haven't done that, you get to just observe. Uh, if you have, uh, as you walk in, there are some, so without, I know some of you in the back can probably see, so without looking over there, uh, what words greet you as you walk through the door? Right? Yeah, 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 right? Yeah. The question, are there words? Yep, yep. Okay. When you come, but it's like right when you come in the door, there's a picture hanging on the wall. What does it say? What does it say? It's surely you just, yeah. I'm the resurrection and the life. Yep, yep. Okay. On your way out, there's a picture. I was going to say what I was going to ask a, a question about the color of somebody's robe in that picture, uh, but we'll just, we'll just go really broad. Without looking at the picture, what is on that picture? Last Supper. Okay. What color is Jesus' robe? Red. Okay. Tie dye. There we go. Yeah. All right. So here's the thing, right? So like, so, so for so many of us, there are there are these things that we walk by and we see on a regular basis that we, you know, I love it. Whoever said like, there's a picture. It's like, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we go about in life that we see on a regular basis. And and miss right or or we see and then and then we think oh that's like I remember seeing that when I you know first started coming to Communitas years ago and it was like oh that's kind of a cool cool thing that's a good thing to remember as I as I walk in I dig that I don't think I noticed the the Last Supper picture till after coming here for a while and uh, but it's just it's not something that I think about very often anymore right I've, in some ways we become inoculated to these things and I'm not here to say like how dare you not recognize the art that we have placed around the building, right? Like that's if, don't, don't get that out of today's message, right? Um, but there's this sense in which we see these things and we get kind of inoculated. We, we don't really grasp them. We kind of just gloss over them. And, and as a result, we, we become aware of the wrong things, right? And I think in, in some ways, uh, that's the story of, of Luke chapter 4, um, you know, many of us, if you've spent some time in church or, or if you've read, uh, you know, the, the, you've maybe heard this story before. 
uh, Luke 4, the temptation of Jesus. Uh, it's also in Matthew. It's in Mark. It's in children's stories. Uh, it's also getting some, uh, some traction among psychology and physiology uh, journals just because of, of things of like, how does somebody go out and do something so difficult for 40 days? Can you fast that long? What does that do to the body? What are the effects? What, how, does the brain, uh, how does the brain work after that long? And, and what causes somebody to do something for that long and to be successful? And, and so in some ways we, we can see these things, but we, we kind of, we don't actually see it anymore. And so what I love about this is, is Scripture's continual invitation to awake, O sleeper. And even the way that scripture is written, right? It's not written uh, to just read one time and then never engage with again, right? It's, it's meant to be to, to read it once. It's like a good meal, right? Like you eat a good meal. Like how many of us have had, like maybe later on today, you're gonna have a good meal and you're like, you know what I'm looking forward to? The next time I get to have this. Yeah, leftovers. Like I'm looking forward to the next time because why? Because we savor it. And these things that we savor, we long for. And so in many ways, that's how the scriptures are written, that we would continue to long to, to know more and to see Jesus more clearly. And for some of us, when we look at, at Luke 4, uh, we just see that, that more kind of psychological, physiological, just like, hey, that's an interesting thing. That's a, that's a curious story. I, I, would, I would like to learn more about that if it were convenient and if I had time. And so maybe you're like me and you add it to your, your watch later list on YouTube and you just watch it grow into the hundreds and file itself way down at the bottom and you know, we'll see if and when we come around to it. And for some of us, we, we maybe know the story and, and we're going, oh yeah, I, I kind of dig it because it's about this guy who's got on this spiritual journey and, and kind of like some of the other mystics and he goes out and, and just kind of through his grit and fortitude, there's, there's this enlightenment that happens. And I dig that. I, I'm curious about that. And for some of us, it becomes a story of encouragement, where we go, how do I overcome sin? What does it look like for me to be able to resist temptation in my life and actually live life to the full? And regardless of where we're at on the theological spectrum, I think all of us, there are certain areas of our life where we would like to be able to do something or not do another thing. And we draw encouragement from someone who has done that. And so for some of us, we look at, at Luke 4, and we go, yeah, that's, this is this thing about how I overcome. And while all these perspectives, I think, do contain uh, some facts, I don't think that is what Luke is actually trying to do. I don't think that Luke is trying to prop Jesus up as some sort of influencer or lifestyle system structure person or a self-help guru but rather I think he's trying to present Jesus as clearly and compellingly as possible as the Son of God, the true and only Savior, the one who's delivered all of humanity, including you and me, from our sin and wrath of God to forgiveness and life with God. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 4. Um, Verses 1 and 2, so, and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. So uh, the Jordan, sometimes I think, uh, is anybody like me where you, like, you, you picture Jesus' baptism, like kind of like the baptisms that, that we've done where you go out to like, this really nice, big, huge body of water, and they dunk down, and it's cool, and, and whatever else. Uh, so the, the Jordan sometimes was like that, but most of the time it was kind of like a creek. It was like, maybe you see, like, I mean, in springtime around here, like in a couple of weeks, some of our ditches will flow greater than the, the Jordan River, okay? Like it's, um, that's just kind of a, a thing. Um, and so, but there's this contrast. So he's, he's there and he's, he's in the Jordan and there's at least some water. There's enough for him to get down into the water. And so there's this contrast. So he's, he's out in the Jordan and, and he returns from that and he goes out into the desert. So how many of us have we gone from really high and great experiences in our life, and then they're all of a sudden followed by these extreme lows? Jesus knows this. This is his experience. He's aware of that, right? And so, and so, so Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returns from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. Love Luke's insight there. 
Yeah, he went on a 40-day walkabout, didn't bring any food with him, and when he got home, he was like, you know, I could go for a sandwich. Yes. Yes, I could too. All right? Thank you, Luke. And, what, and, and so what Luke's doing is kind of giving us an overview in those two days. He's like, hey, this is what happened. Um, and I think what's also interesting about this is, is there's nobody else out there. Right? So the way that Luke gets this is that Jesus has told this story to other disciples who have relayed this. So this is something that Jesus would have shared with his disciples about like, hey, this is, you know, so like, I got baptized. My father said to me, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. And, and instead of like rallying some big group to go overthrow or do some coup, he's like, and so as a result of that, I just wanted to foster that. I wanted to keep that. I wanted to tend to that. And so I spent some time in prayer. I spent some time away. And, and while I was out there in prayer, being led by the Holy Spirit in the middle of the wilderness, here's what happens. The devil comes to me and he says, if you're the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. So as uh, in this area where Jesus is, I've not been there, but uh, I've seen some pictures and and heard a little about this, but apparently there are these stones that if you are really hungry, they look a little bit like loaves of bread. It would not take much for me, uh, you you all know about my love of food. Uh, It would not take much for me to look at a rock and think, yeah, that could be a type of bun or biscuit or croissant or whatever, right? But apparently these kind of look like little loaves of bread. And so what the devil is doing here is he is, he's tempting Jesus through uh, trying to get him to doubt God's provision. Okay. And, and so, and so, and, and, and I just love, love Jesus' response here. He says, man will not live on bread alone. And, and, he's, and he's getting us in to, to go back. And he's thinking, uh, he's, he's, and, and if, we're, if we're one of Luke's audiences, we're going, man, how is he going to react to this? Because right, in so many ways, we think about I mean, why, why is it so important that we do communion? Well, I think in some ways, because some of the first ways that we become separated from God is at a meal that he does not serve. And so we come back together at the meal that he does serve, right? And so we think back to Adam, And we think back to what does faithfulness look like? And and Luke has just ended us with this genealogy. And so when when Luke is going, so Luke is presenting this information to us, and he's trying to get us to understand, we've got the story of of Adam in the back of our minds. We've got what does it, what is a faithful, how does a faithful son actually obey the father? And if you're one of Luke's readers and, and you're thinking about this and you're wondering deep within your soul, what does obedience look like? How do we walk with the Lord? What is this, how is this temptation actually going to play out? You maybe have in mind the various patriarchs, right? The various promises that were given to people. And, and you're wondering to yourself, you're going, man, I too am wondering, what does it look like to walk in obedience? I too am wondering, what does it look like to be fulfilled? I too am wondering, what does wholeness and satisfaction look like in light of who I've been created? In, in, in whose image I've been created. And so as we're looking at this story, we're going, okay, how is, how is he, how, what's Jesus going to do here? And maybe we're wondering, and maybe we know the story a little bit, and we're going, is, is he going to be like Noah? Like, and, and, and if we think about the history of, uh, of, of the Hebrew scriptures, and if we go through and we're going, man, was, was Noah going to be the guy? Oh, Noah wasn't quite the guy. Well, Abraham, was, was he, I mean, he was, he was blessed, he, he blessed others, and he'd be this alternative community, and, and did that work out? Oh, no, I didn't quite do that. Well, well what about, what about um, maybe, maybe some of the judges? That, oh, no, that was kind of a mess, too. Um, okay, well, what about, uh, what about oh, okay, well, then, then Samuel came along, and then, and then we're supposed to be this kingdom, not with priests, but a kingdom of priests, and to help other people understand that they've been forgiven, and, and is that going to happen, and did, did, did that ever come to fruition? Oh, no, it, it didn't quite do that, did it? Okay, um, well, what, then there was, there was Saul. That didn't quite work out. There was David. He didn't quite work out. Solomon. That didn't quite work out. And then and the kingdom split. Was, is one of those two kingdoms? Do we look back to that? Are they going to be where our hope is found? Is that going to provide the solution? Or it didn't quite work. Maybe the exile? The, the chance that, you know, once we bought, gotten brought back into captivity and then they, we got brought back to Israel, is that going to, if we just think back to that, can we rebuild? Make it great again? Is that going to work? No, it doesn't. And so now you've got this group of people that are recalling this whole story and they're going through and they're going, is this, 
is this, is this going to tell me about my hope? Is, is this going to satisfy that deep longing within my soul? Is this going to answer the questions that I have about how to get right with God and actually live life to the full instead of living this truncated version of life, this myopic perspective, this, this hollow way of being? And so we're asking the question, will the Spirit-filled Son obey the faithful Father? And so, here we go. We read on. And we see that Jesus answers Satan by just dropping some scripture toward him. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't argue. There's, there's no debate. He says, man will not live. Man shall not live on bread alone. He's just going back to, to Deuteronomy. He's quoting, uh, he's just recalling the story of the people that are going, hey, uh, they're looking for their sustenance, for their provision. And Jesus says, I know that the Lord will provide for me. And now maybe we're going, but wait a minute. Like, what's wrong with Jesus having a snack? What would be wrong with that? Jesus knows that his gifts are not to be used for his service, but for the service of others. Not for his glory, but for the glory of others. One other thing I find really interesting about this is, um, any of you ever been hungry and been tempted to turn a rock into a sandwich? I, I haven't. Have you? Honest question. Anybody? Right? Why not? You can't. Right? Like, just not part of my experience. I mean, somebody out there maybe has. I just not my, part of my experience, right? But what I love about this, and it shows the distinctness of Jesus, right, is that, is that Satan knows, I know you can do it. Like, it's a temptation because he knows that Jesus can do it. Jesus is different. He's not just, he's a man, but he's not just a man. So this is distinct. So, they, so then, then the devil's like, okay, well, if, if I can't get you on, on the protection thing, let's appeal to your sense of, of dominion. And, uh, and, and so, so the devil takes him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give, I give it to you, whom I, I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Also, if, if you're the Messiah, if you're the one who's come to, uh, and, and the promise has been that, that you will have dominion, that you will rule and reign, I mean, convenient, right? And, and you've, you've been promised and it's known that, that the road to the crown is through the cross, and all of a sudden, I mean, would it not be kind of convenient to just go, yeah, you know, if I didn't have to die and I could just have dominion, that seems decent. How many of us, if it was like, hey, all the promises of your life will come to fruition um, and you can either have it with nails through your hands or without. How many of us are going to go, you know what? I was getting all psyched up for, for nails in, but if you're offering me nails out, I mean, I'm kind of a weenie. I don't like slivers. And so, I, right, like, we can see why this appeals. Okay? But what do we do when, when crisis comes? We, we fall back on, on how we've been trained, on what we believe, and on our core attachments, our deep, what resonates deep within our soul. And so when the temptation comes to take the easy way out, comes along, when, when the temptation comes to, to not ultimately fulfill the mission, to not ultimately bring redemption and, and, and salvation to all which has been shattered and broken and lost, Jesus answers, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He goes, Jesus, I'm, I'm not interested in, in second-rate salvation. I'm not interested in hollowness. I'm out 
I'm, I'm in this for hallowedness. He recognizes I've been consecrated, I've been blessed, I've been set apart. And I'm here to bring this truth and this good news and this kingdom to all who will listen and follow and believe. And he says, and so, no. No, Satan, I'm, I'm not interested. Only Yahweh will I serve. So the devil goes, okay. O2 count, got one more. Let's see what we got. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written. I love this. He's just like, he's like, okay, if, if you're the son of God, I know like I, I, I put that in doubt for a little, well, let's just pretend because if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. So essentially what Satan is doing is, is there was this rabbinic teaching that believed that the Messiah would appear on, uh, in this particular spot in the temple. Now, at the time, if you were to be, if you were to stand in that particular spot and you were to toss yourself off the wall, you've got about a 450 foot fall slash tumble until you hit the Kidron Valley. Okay? So we're talking about a football field and a half. Just like Wiley e. Coyote off the side, right? Now, uh, I can't fly. I don't know if any of you can. Um, but if if you wanted to gain some notoriety, if you wanted to get some attention, if you wanted to bring credence to your message, if you wanted people to follow you. Do you think that maybe jumping off a 450-foot building and then just calmly walking down the street as though nothing else happened might attract a little bit of attention? Like, tell me, I mean, honestly, if, if you saw a video online that said, man jumps off a 450-foot tall building and walks away, and it was legit. It wasn't like one of those sketchy virus sites, but it was just like on YouTube. You'd click it, wouldn't you? No? Like, yeah, right? We're like, yeah, I'd be, I'd be kind of interested. Like, even if he fell into a foam pit, I'd be like, well, okay, whatever. But that's essentially, so Satan's like, no, no. No foam pit. Just hard, rocky, desert bottom. So just, just do that, man. Now, there's two things going on here. One, there's manipulation. Okay? How many of you uh, have, have told others that, that you would protect them? That, that you, you have their best interest in mind? Right? And, and, and you know, so I, I, I do that with, with our kids. I'm like, hey, Fran, you know, like, I'm, I'm out here for your, you know, I'm, I got your back, kiddo. And, and we've talked about the story about how, like, sometimes there's this dog that will, like, come over and, like, come after and like just wanted to sniff her and she would get really nervous and so she'd like stick her hand up in the air and I'd just like come over and pick her up and, and all was well, right? Now there so there's one thing though, like sometimes when, when Fran's playing with her cousins, she'll like go pick a fight with one of the big ones. And then she runs over to me and she's like, Help me, Daddy. And I'm like, Hey look, kiddo. I'm like I'm not in this just to win fights for you. I'm like, I'll protect you from danger, but if you're picking fights, like, we got to have another conversation, right? Now, that's a, that's a light and trivial story here, but what, G, what, what Satan is trying to get Jesus to do is he's going, hey, I want you to, like, I'm going to, like, I want you to put yourself in harm's way, and let's just see if the Father comes to save you. Like, I, I know that he'll provide for you. We've already set, proven he's going to give you dominion. But, like, is he actually going to protect you? Like, why don't you go do something nuts? See if he actually does it. So, one, we've got manipulation, right? If you're God the Father and, and, and the Son's like, hey, protect me, and then he's out, like, playing in traffic, you're like, well, yeah, I'll protect you. Stay in the yard, <laughs> right? Like, there's a, there's, there's, some, there's a reciprocating relationship there, right? The other component that we have here is there's this notion of sensationalism. Satan's going, hey, Jesus, I bet you can whip up a good crowd. 
I got a good idea of just like how you can get people just to feel really riled up and just feel really good about something and, and get really excited. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be really neat? And Jesus is like, hey, look, what you win them with is what you win them to. If I just play on their emotions, but I don't actually do anything in the way of life change, he goes, it's, it's not going to last long. He goes, I, I know people. Because they, they tend to be a little bit fickle. And they're going to tend to just kind of ride the emotional roller coaster. And, and, and they're going to want more, and they're going to want more, and they're going to want more. And she's like, I'm not here to do cheap party tricks. I'm not here to wow them with stunts. I'm here as their savior and as their king. And I'm here to walk in obedience. Not to manipulate my father and not to manipulate them. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So if, if you're here and you're highly empathetic, like maybe you're just like exhausted, you're like, man, my gosh, like, what was it like to be Jesus? I mean, that was, just, that was just a lot going on. And maybe you have questions about what that was like, like what was actually going on and, and when was the temptation and, and, and you're kind of curious on the, the psychological, the, phil- or the physiological side. But wherever we are, the message I think that Luke is trying to get across is Jesus, the spirit-filled son, obeys the faithful father. Jesus, the spirit-filled son, obeys the faithful father. Remember those patriarchs? Do you remember Noah, Abraham, his sons, Moses, the nation of Israel, Joshua, judges, the kings, all these people who were to be setting, who were to set example, who had sensational relationships with with God, had these radical encounters. but who at various times didn't actually believe that God would be faithful to do as he promised, that he couldn't actually be, pr- be trusted. Jesus just proves that God is in fact faithful to his promise. And the promise that he said that he would bring the Messiah and, and, and that one day all would be turned right again, Luke is saying, here is your Messiah. Here is the Son of God, your one and only Savior. And, and maybe you're here and you're wondering, well, what about the rest of the book? Does the pattern continue? Spoiler alert. Um, does he obey? In chapter 23, we'll see that he does obey even to death on a cross. And in so doing, as we discussed on Friday, he nails our curse to the cross, canceling the debt we owed but could not pay and brings those who believe in him into unity with God the Father, ending the lifelong distance from the promised paradise. On the way to the cross, he'll turn, he'll make bread appear. People will marvel at his dominion and they'll be wooed by his power. But in chapter 23, what we see, what moves them what ultimately compels them toward obedience, what the, what the Spirit uses within them is his death. We see those that look and say, truly, this man is the Son of God. He offers his own body as a sacrifice. Not, not really your, your play, right? If, you're, like if you want to take over the world, is offering your body the way to do it? It seems it seems pretty common. Like that's that's one of those really common experiences. Like we're all gonna die. That's a that's a thing that's gonna happen at some point. But he doesn't stay dead for long. The obedient son is raised to life again by the power of the Holy Spirit in accordance with the will of the faithful Father, that none would perish, but have life in his name and have life to the full. And by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, his obedience now becomes our obedience. And this obedience isn't merely a one-time event. This is an obedience in which we get to live forever. And as his obedience becomes our obedience, his ways become our ways. The longer we live life in the Spirit, the more and more we, 
we become like Christ. And I think for those of us who don't believe this, it seems we kind of fall into one of two camps, right? There's, there's those of us who just, just don't believe. We think, oh, this is a, this is a fantastic story. Um, you know, maybe we think it's a myth. We think uh, it's, it's a nice, it's, it's encouraging. It's a, it's a good moral lesson. And at worst, we believe that it's just, some, it's just made up. And then I think there are those of us who, who, who are trying to walk with Jesus, but we, we find ourselves getting caught up uh, in, our, in our own way. We focus so much on, on our sin and the fact that we can't resist temptation, um, and we fail in such remember that, that we're a beloved son or daughter of God. And, and the focus becomes on sin management, not on singing praise to the Savior. And so wherever you are, Jesus' death still covers your disbelief. And I pray that it begins to inform your doubts. One of the things I really like about preaching uh, Luke 1 through 4 and even thinking about the beginning of Matthew and some of the other Gospels, um, there isn't really a lot of like keen application. Right, like this isn't one of those where you come in and you're like, oh, the next step is so plain to see. It's not like the Pauline epistles where he's just like, hey, go be patient and pray a lot. You're like, oh, okay. He just drops the story right in front of us, and so if we're like, what what can be a takeaway? What what does this look like? How do we how do we play this out? I'll say this: be obedient to Jesus, and you will be obedient like Jesus. Be obedient to Jesus, and you will be obedient like Jesus. When we come into, into a wilderness experience, when, when, when we are tempted, when, when, when despair seems around us, don't be afraid. There's no need to be afraid. Just aware. Look again at Jesus. The heart of resistance of temptation is not self-talk about how good or bad we are or the, what the potential consequences of our action or inaction could be. The heart of resistance of temptation is the loyal love of God. That is our focus. Notice, again, that Jesus doesn't entertain conversation with Satan. He doesn't say, like, like, yeah, let's 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 talk this out. Let's let's see if there's a balance here. Let's let's see where we can kind of strike uh, something in between. Let's let's see, you know, where where we can come to terms. Jesus, is like, no, why why would I do any of that? Like, do you not? I'm running tight with my father. I don't. I got secure attachment to him. He and I are are lock solid. I don't. I don't need any of the things that you're offering. Not at all. Not at all. And so we see that temptation is no match for Christ. And we get to follow the Father like Christ follows the Father. And so if there's an application, I'd say it could be this. There are some invitations here. I think we see the, invita the invitation to be filled up. Not just, and I, it seems sometimes we get this, uh, this, can, this can fall into the sensation where we're like, oh, I just need to get a little more Holy Spirit. I just need to get a little more filled up. If, if you are in Christ, you have been filled and you can't spill it. It doesn't like, run out. It, it's not something, if you don't get more of it, it's in you. The Holy Spirit, he is in you. If you are in Christ, 100%, all the way, he doesn't go missing, you don't like run out to the store and get more, you don't use it up, he's in you, in fullness. And so be filled. Recognize the hollowness of life without Christ and the hallowedness of life with Christ. So be filled up. Secondly, be prayed up. Be, be prayed. I mean, just spend time in prayer. What does it look like to spend time with? I mean, I just it just compels me that when I think about like the opportunities that I've missed to be able to just spend time with God. 
that he invites us to do that. Not just this little God that we picture that lives inside of our heart like some sort of weird like Grinch cartoon sort of thing, but that he actually he exists. And he is seated on the throne. And he rules and reigns. And he brought all that is seen and unseen into existence by the mere breath. And he invites us to pray and to converse and to be with him to be informed and formed by him and invites us to say, hey, what's going on in your life? What a delight. It helps us to continue to have our minds conformed to the likeness of Christ. So be filled up, be prayed up, and then be Bibled up. Again, look, Jesus isn't arguing. He's not debating with, with Satan. He's just going, hey, look, this is what I know to be true. This is what's been written. What you got? And Satan's like, it's mm, a good point. I guess I'll go do something else then. And he's just sitting there just dropping bombs. Informing, saying, no, look, this is where you're wrong. He says, this is what's right. Notice he's not accusing. He's just going, no, th- this is what's right. This is what's right. No argument, no accusation. No threats, just here's what's right. This is what's right. This is what's right. Satan, hey, what about this idea? No, this way. What about over here? No, this way. How about this? No. Mike is like, dude, your time is limited. You have no dominion or power. Jesus says, I have the dominion and the power. Now, not all of us will go out and spend 40 days in the wilderness without food. Not all of us will have this type of encounter. Uh, Not of us. uh, Not all of us will 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 die martyred or or uh, um, you know. But as we see here, the way of the beloved son or daughter of God is is not merely hanging out by the river with your friends, right? Like it would have been like if you're Jesus and John, like he could have just hung out by the river and. No big deal, right? But as we've seen, the mission is far too important. To get the message out to be that they have been blessed to be a blessing, that the the message in in the life of the beloved means we we must go out. It involves hard work in hard places. It's a life defined by doing God's will, God's way, even if there are painful consequences. But we know this the cross, and as we celebrate today, the empty tomb, remind us that our provision, our dominion, and our protection have been secured by the obedience of the Spirit-filled Son who obeyed the faithful Father, that we too would walk with him today and every day. And so the question that, that Luke 4 begs to ask us is, will you do it? Will you follow today? And so the question I'll leave you with is, is who is Jesus to you? How are you aware of him? Who he really is? And what is he doing in your life? For some of us, we, we think that it, it's mere fantasy. Or, or at best, it's a, a moral, moral story. It's a good example. For the others of us, he is Savior, he is Lord. And so wherever you are today, I would, I would pray that you would, con- that you would consider Jesus for who he says he is. That you would follow him in light of, of what he has done. That you would receive the, the spirit-filled encouragement that he gives us to walk with life and life to the full. That he is, has secured that for us. That the curse has been nailed to the cross. And the promise of the faithful father has come true. And if you're here today and you find yourself just, oh, I want to do that, but I just keep getting, I keep getting tripped up on my temptations. Let's focus less on our sin and more on our Savior. And for those of us who are here and we're in the time where we're merely delighting in the fact that we are the beloved, may you continue to walk and be steeped in that, to be deeply encouraged that you too would encourage others to do the same, that they too may walk in this, that they too may know the deep, deep love of God. And so when we hear God's voice, 
we remember. When we hear God's voice, we remind. And when we hear God's voice, we rejoice. May we remember that the Spirit-filled Son walks in obedience to the faithful Father. May we remind others of this good news. And may we rejoice that in so doing, Jesus has nailed our curse to the cross, ending forever the enmity between humanity and God and invites us to walk along with him in unity with the Father that we would be a distinct people for the blessing of the world. And so may you stand as we continue to worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this sacrifice. We thank you for your glory. We thank you for your salvation. We pray, Lord, that this would be something that we would accept and that we would walk in each and every single day that your good news would continue to inform every situation of our life, that we would continue to delight in you more and more and more, that we would continue to walk in your ways, that we would, we would have perseverance and endurance, that situation and circumstance would not dissuade us from following and obedient, being obedient to you. But we know that for those of us who are in you, that, that you are in us and that your spirit has filled us. And so we rejoice, Lord, that we too, can be obedient, that we too can live sacrificially, that we too can invite others to follow and to join you in life to the full.